political inaugurations. If it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America. Hello and welcome to First Post America, your global pit stop for the latest news and headlines from the United States and around the world. I'm Eric Ham coming to you live from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. We'll get you a roundup of all the day's top stories, but first, let's take a look at the headlines. Close quarter fighting continues in Gaza as Muslims in the Palestinian enclave mark the end of the holy month of Ramadan. Israel says its troops wiped out an entire terrorist cell on Ed. The United States agrees to sell $138 million worth of military equipment to Ukraine on an urgent basis as the larger $60 billion aid package remains stalled in Congress. In a major blow to President Yoon suk Yo, South Korea's opposition is projected to triumph in parliamentary elections with exit polls suggesting a massive lead. Thailand deploys troops to its north after a border town in Myanmar falls to rebel groups as Myanmar's military junta suffers more losses on the front lines. A South African court allows former President Jacob Zuma to run for office, overturning an earlier decision that barred him from contesting the polls. The African nation will hold its general election on the 29th of May. We begin in the United States and the race for the White House, where it is deja vu all over again. Donald Trump is reportedly looking to launch federal investigations into President Joe Biden and his family if, in fact, Trump is reelected as president of the United States. Trump's allies say that the former president would only be replicating the actions of the Biden administration. Trump's campaign says that the current federal charges against the ex-president have set a precedent for prosecuting President Biden. The strategy of threatening his opponents, of course, with jail time is not new for Donald Trump. We all, of course, can remember during the 2016 presidential election, Donald Trump launched a similar campaign against then Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton. Chance of lock her up became a mainstay at Trump's political rallies. And after being elected president, Donald Trump did in fact carry through on his promise and ordered the Justice Department to probe Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation. After years of investigation, the case was dismissed for a lack of evidence just days before Donald Trump left office in 2021. Now Donald Trump has set his eyes on his newest political opponent, Joe Biden. This despite Donald Trump himself facing 44 federal criminal charges, 40 of which are related to the classified documents case and the remaining four linked to the, his attempts to overturn the 2020 presidential election. And the list does not end there. The former president has another 44 criminal charges at the state level. 10 of those are from the 2020 Georgia state election case, while the remaining 34 are from Donald Trump's hush money trial, which is scheduled to begin in five days in Manhattan. Now, should Donald Trump be reelected, he could, in fact, dismiss the federal charges. However, he would still have to face state charges where the evidence in those two cases appears to be airtight. And this is a major reason why Donald Trump has, in fact, been trying desperately to delay the trials. Donald Trump's primary strategy has been to try to delay things until after the election, where he would have much more ability to thwart or de delay further consideration of the criminal. 
Now, Donald Trump has repeatedly called the cases against him a political witch hunt. And now, of course, we all know the lock her up stick worked to perfection in sullying Hillary Clinton in the eyes of voters, especially in light of an ongoing investigation into her emails. However, it remains to be seen just how effective a similar effort will be against President Joe Biden. Already efforts at impeachment have cut, crashed and burned by Republicans, but it is an election year and it is Donald Trump, which means expect the unexpected. And now to tensions in the Middle East. Another conflict has erupted in the region, and this time a trade war between Turkey and Israel. Turkey has announced restrictions on exports to Israel as tensions between the two nations spiral. Last night, Turkey accused Israel of preventing it from airdropping aid into Gaza. We submitted our request to join this aid operation with cargo planes belonging to our Air Force. We learned today that our request, which had been approved by Jordanian authorities, was rejected by Israel. Now, Turkey will no longer export products to Israel from 54 categories, including jet fuel, iron, steel and construction materials. Turkey is Israel's fifth largest supplier and the exports amount to almost five billion dollars. Ankara says that the export ban will be lifted only if Israel adheres to international humanitarian law and allows aid into Gaza. These measures, which were approved by our Honorable President, will be implemented step by step without delay. These measures will be shared with our public by our related institutions. These measures will remain in place until Israel declares a ceasefire and allows the unhindered access of humanitarian aid to Gaza. Now, Israel has hit back at Turkey and doubled down on its previous accusations against the Turkish president of supporting Hamas. Again, unfortunately, is once again sacrificing the economic interests of the people of Turkey uh, for his support of Hamas, the murderers uh, in Gaza who raped, murdered and desecrated the bodies of women, girls, adults and burned children alive. We've made it quite clear that Israel will not give in to violence and extortion and we will not condone the one-sided violation of the trade agreements and we will take parallel measures against Turkey which will harm the Turkish economy. Israel has urged its allies, including the United States, to take action against Turkey ranging from de-investing to economic sanctions. In addition, the foreign minister has instructed the uh, Israeli foreign ministry officials to contact countries and organizations uh, in the United States to stop investments in Turkey and to prevent the import of products from Turkey and to our friends in the American Congress to examine the violation of the boycott laws and impose sanctions on Turkey accordingly. Now, so far, Washington has remained silent on Israel's request of taking action against Turkey. Instead, President Joe Biden, in one of his strongest criticisms of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, so far has called his actions in Gaza a mistake. And now in another blow to Israel, Australia is, is, is considering the recognition of Palestine as a state. Prime Minister Netanyahu is rapidly losing support both at home and abroad. Meanwhile, the calls for snap elections are only growing louder among Israelis and in the corridors of power in Washington. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu has often been referred to as a magician for his ability to survive multiple political storms. But now the question looms, has he finally run out of tricks? And now to the Russia-Ukraine war. Europe's largest nuclear plant, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine, is under severe threat. The nuclear plant has come under attack for the third consecutive day, and it's been witnessing a series of drone attacks. In fact, just on Tuesday, a drone fell on the roof of a training center at the plant. 
We are near the building of the training center. Its roof has been attacked by a drone today. Attack by the Ukrainian armed forces happened 10 minutes after IAEA specialists drove past the center. They were returning from the regular visit to the outside radiation monitoring laboratory. This training center is unique because it is real hardware including nuclear reactor room. The only thing that is missing here is nuclear fuel. On Sunday alone, there were three drone attacks with one hitting a reactor. Now Russia and Ukraine have been trading charges over renewed threats to the nuclear plant. Moscow alleges Kyiv has been behind the attacks on the plant, which is currently Russian occupied. The Kremlin said these attacks were very dangerous and can have very grave consequences. However, Ukraine's military intelligence has denied Russia's claims. In fact, it's accused Russia of staging these attacks so that it can spread false information about Ukraine. Kiev says Moscow has hit up to 80% of Ukraine's conventional power plants and more than half of its hydroelectric plants in recent weeks. Ukraine's position is clear and unequivocal. We did not commit any military actions or provocations on nuclear facilities. The aggressor has to leave the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Now the UN nuclear watchdog will hold a special meeting on Thursday on the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. The International Atomic Energy Agency said its team has not been given any access to the attack site as of yet. Well, uh, what happened yesterday uh, happened in a unit that is under Russian control. So they indicate that they have nothing to do with because it is obvious because they are the owners. I also consulted as I should, my Ukrainian counterparts, who are also saying that they have nothing to do with that. But somebody did it. Okay. All right? Um, for me, the important thing is that this doesn't happen. My objective is to avoid nuclear accidents. And calling the attacks reckless, the European Union's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, said it has increased the risk of a dangerous nuclear accident. The Zaporizhia facility is one of the 10 biggest nuclear plants in the world. All six reactors at the plant, which is located near Ukraine's front lines, have been shut down for months. But it does in fact require constant power to cool the reactors and prevent a, a potential nuclear disaster similar to Chernobyl in 1986. And shifting focus to Africa now, our next report is a glaring example of irony that has left millions of Nigerians fuming. The country's poverty alleviation minister has been accused of stealing from the poor. 37-year-old Beta Edu is under fire over alleged diversion of public money into her own personal accounts. In the latest, a financial watchdog has recovered $24 million that was traced to over 50 private bank accounts. Now this comes as a big embarrassment for Nigeria's president, Bola Tinubo, who was elected last year after promising to rid the country of corruption and, power, of, and poverty. Our next report explains. Can you imagine a traffic cop breaking road safety rules? Or those preaching fight against climate change taking a private jet ride? Well, while the latter may not be unimaginable, it is certainly ironic. The next glaring example of dramatic irony is from Nigeria, where the country's poverty alleviation minister has been accused of stealing from the poor. This is Beta Edu. She is facing an intense probe over corruption charges. Nigeria's financial watchdog has recovered 30 billion naira or 24 billion dollars that were traced to more than 50 bank accounts. In January, Nigerian President Bola Tinubu suspended Edu and ordered a probe into her ministry over alleged diversion of $640,000 of public money into personal bank accounts. The 37-year-old poverty alleviation minister denies any wrongdoing. Her office says she did approve the transfer into a personal account, which was not in her name, but said it was for the implementation of grants to vulnerable groups. Now, the country's financial watchdog says it has found many angles to examine in this case. 
It has also extended the investigation to the entire network of Nigeria's social investment programs. The suspension of a minister is a rare occurrence in Nigeria. Over years, there has also been a cloud of secrecy that surrounds governance in the country. Details of how officials get and use public funds are often withheld. So when details of the latest corruption scandal began trickling in, it left the citizens fuming. They are calling for the minister to be fired. Millions of people in Africa's most populous country are facing extreme levels of poverty. The government's harsh economic policies have further squeezed their livelihoods. In the year 2023, Bola Tinubu was elected president after promising to rid the country of chronic corruption and extreme poverty. He said his government is committed to uphold the highest standards of integrity, transparency and accountability in how Nigeria's resources are managed. If Beta Edu is proven guilty, this could be President Tinubu's chance to fulfill his biggest poll promise. Will the Nigerian president take the lead in the country's fight against corruption? And finally, scientists are using satellites to detect methane emissions from space, and they found landfills to be one of the main culprits. The organic waste decomposing in these landfills is fueling methane emissions, which are responsible for around 30% of global warming. Our report explains how methane impacts the planet and what can be done to prevent further damage. There's a new eye in the sky to keep track of all our climate crimes. Scientists are now using satellites to detect methane emissions from space. There are more than a dozen satellites revolving around the Earth, scanning pollution and feeding that information back to researchers, policymakers and industry experts. When we think about methane emissions, we often picture coal mines or cattle sheds. But according to these satellites, there's a bigger culprit sitting around the corner. It's none other than landfills. Yes, those garbage dumps that you so often see near your homes are one of the biggest reasons for methane emissions across the world. Experts believe that organic waste decomposition in landfills is spewing large amounts of methane. In the US, the Environmental Protection Agency has detected significant methane emissions at more than half of the landfills. It says 80% of these emissions release at least 100 kilograms of methane per hour. The study may have given figures for the US, but almost every country is staring at the same issue. The latest data from India's Space Research Organization, or ISRO, gives a similar picture of the country's landfills. According to ISRO, garbage dumps in the cities of Mumbai, Ahmedabad and Surat are the top three methane hotspots. Together, they emit an average of 15,000 kilograms of methane every single hour. You might wonder why we're so focused on methane emissions. That's because methane is one big troublemaker for our planet. It's a much more potent gas than carbon dioxide at trapping heat. Once it reaches the atmosphere, it has 80 times more warming power than CO2. Methane also has damaging effects on the ozone layer. Ozone depletion can cause increased amounts of UV radiation to reach the Earth, which can lead to deadly skin cancers, cataracts and impaired immune systems. According to the International Energy Agency, methane is currently responsible for around 30% of global warming. Its concentration in the atmosphere is 2.5 times greater than its pre-industrial levels. Agriculture, oil, natural gas and landfills are among the largest sources of methane emissions. Experts say governments can avoid methane generation in landfills by enforcing simple yet effective measures. Keeping organic waste out of garbage dumps can be the first step. It would help prevent methane leaks and boost programs for composting and organic recycling. Additionally, better landfill covers and early gas collection may help halt the release of methane into the atmosphere. The methane-detecting satellites are just the beginning. 
with huge advances in technology, we'll have more visibility into methane pollution than ever before. Let's focus on climate solutions and try to give these eyes in the sky less to see. That's our show for today. We certainly thank you so much for tuning in. We hope to see you right back here again tomorrow. Thanks again for watching. From impeachments to inaugurations, if it's a political story, we are on the scene. The race for the White House is heating up. We're beating Biden. How dare he say that? If it's breaking news, we're live with the latest coverage. From the White House, the State Department, and Capitol Hill, we know the issues, but above all, we know the players to bring you the latest in-depth analysis on all the key stories that we're covering. I'm Eric Ham. Join me from Washington here on First Post America.